This is Everyday Wellness, a podcast dedicated to helping you achieve your health and wellness goals and provide practical strategies that you can use in your real life. And now, here is your host, nurse practitioner Cynthia Thurlow. I am really excited today to have Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. She's from a Washington University Fellowship Trained Physician in Nutritional Science and Geriatrics and is a board certified family medicine osteopathic manipulation. She completed her undergraduate degree in human nutrition, vitamin and mineral metabolism at the University of Illinois. Dr. Lyon works closely with the special ops military and has a private practice in New York City. In addition, her practice services the leaders, innovators, mavericks, executives in their prospective fields. She brings unparalleled results to her patients with personalized advanced nutritional interventions, metabolic and genetic testing, and behavioral action implementation. She leverages evidence-based medicine with emerging cutting-edge science to restore metabolism, balance hormones, and optimize body composition with the goal of a lifetime of vitality. I'm so excited to have you with us this morning. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. And I should mention, she also is a rock star mom that has a little one at home <laughs> yeah. and in medical school. So with social distancing, things have gotten interesting. How are you all kind of managing with all these new restrictions on what we can do? It's really interesting. As you know, and Cynthia, we've uh, met before and, and kind of had this conversation, but my husband was a Navy SEAL, just recently retired. He loves this. He feels like he's on deployment. He thinks it's the greatest thing ever. That's amazing. It's a, and it's also, you know, the mindset for so many of us, it's like, we have to kind of pivot and reframe and it's like, okay, this is the new normal. And how do we yeah. exist in this space? And, you know, I, I think my children, I have a 12 year old and a 14 year old and the extrovert, the only extrovert in our home is the one who struggled the most. Now he's yeah. kind of found his way but it has definitely been the most downtime that they've ever had in their entire lives. And myself included. I mean, I'm used Mm -hmm. to flying all over and traveling and that's all on hold right now. Yeah. It's going to be very interesting to see how reintegration goes Mm -hmm. because those people that are more introverted now have the space to actually be introverted as opposed to the introvert who is extroverted for their job or, Mm -hmm for some other reason, you know? So then that reintegration is going to be interesting. Oh, absolutely. And for me being an introvert, this has been wonderful. Like, (laughs) you know, we all, we all come together for meals, but you know, during the day, everyone's doing schoolwork or work work and trying to explain to everyone that this, this will eventually not be the case. And so all that transition will be like, so I'd love for you to kind of start the conversation about how you got so interested. I mean, I would imagine that most well, nearly every physician I've ever known, um, most physicians don't have such a strong interest in nutrition. So where did that actually stem from? Yeah. Um, So Cynthia, you and I met at the Nutritional Therapy Association. um, I think Nutrition Therapy Association, maybe? Yes, Nutritional Therapy Association. (laughs) (laughs) And one of the reasons that I was so excited to go there was I was going to be able to get to spend time with my godmother. Mm -hmm. And my godmother is Liz Lipsky. It's amazing. And she is one of the OGs of functional medicine. She is a PhD in nutritional science, has been a professor for a very long time, written the book Digestive Wellness that I think it's in its fifth edition. And I moved in with her when I was 17. So I graduated high school early. I moved in with her and this whole world of nutrition opened up. So at 17, my trajectory into nutrition and functional medicine began. So you were way ahead of the curve then. I think for so many of us that are traditionally trained, it takes us a little while and then we pivot and then we think, okay, we need to take a a much closer look at food and nutrition, how that impacts our bodies positively and negatively. I definitely believe there are pros and cons of doing it both ways. So for example, having been indoctrinated from a very young age, Mm -hmm. Going through traditional medicine, I did two residencies and a fellowship, which is a long time. The challenge was I had all this other knowledge Mm -hmm. that was deeply steeped in belief and seeing improvement, having to then fit that model into a traditional medical system. And that was very challenging. I would say some of my most challenging moments were 
watching and being a part of traditional medicine. How did you weather that? I mean, did you have to subjugate your true interests or how did that process kind of evolve for you? That's a very interesting question. It was incredibly difficult. I did a fellowship in geriatrics. Part of the deal was 50% of my fellowship was nutritional sciences at one of the best institutions in the world, top three out of Sam Klein's lab, who is one of the most respected physicians, researchers in his field of nutritional sciences. The deal was, right, there's always a deal Mm -hmm. that I got the opportunity to do that. However, I also had to do geriatrics as part of my fellowship, which was taking care of people at the end of life, doing a lot of death bedsides, sitting next to people as they're passing over to whatever the transition is next. I mean, it was very difficult. How I weathered that storm, uh, I did a lot of meditation and I really had to be extremely aware of my nervous system. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I never had to put something to the side because I was doing that combined fellowship. But man, it was tough. Very tough. What an incredible opportunity, though. I mean, you're seeing two entirely different sides of, of yeah. a coin, if you will. Um, and I, I think, too, you know, I spent 16 years working in cardiology and uh, so much of the work that we were doing was really just managing symptoms, um, right. managing symptoms until someone got sick enough and then their body transitioned over, as you mentioned. Uh, and, and finding that a lot of the modalities that we were using were making people, maybe they were improving symptoms, but they hastened, you know, morbidity and mortality. Right. right. And that was hard to process. For sure. And I would say, but I would say to this day, it's still difficult. Mm-hmm. However, it really puts a bit of a pressure on the message. Muscle centric medicine is everything. Optimizing your metabolism is everything. Mm -hmm. And I come from a perspective of seeing end of life. Mm -hmm. I come from a perspective of seeing death. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself is incredibly powerful when you look at the current climate and the current conversation, which is, should we be plant-based? Should we not be plant-based? All these arguments that are incredibly political and incredibly skewed. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, when you are really looking at quality of life, There's no conflict. And that's what the message really evolved for me is really being able to advocate for people who cannot advocate for themselves because of being confused or I heard we should just be vegan and vegetarian and that eating meat is bad for the planet and eating meat is bad for our body. And that's that couldn't be further from the truth. And um I have seen this firsthand and I've studied it under world leading experts. So that's truly what I want to be able to offer your people is a really good perspective of truth and how there are simple things that they can do to protect themselves this age. And I think it's, there's so much confusion. I think there's so much, you know, I, I want to believe that some people are well-meaning, but a lot of people have an agenda that they're trying to push And so, you know, there was a book I was reading, um, it's Nutrition in Crisis, and it was talking about a lot of the faulty research that's kind of propagated within the media. And and I do think, I mean, I hear it from women and men every day. They're just so confused. They're like, I don't know what to, you know, the game changed. Totally agree. A whole different discussion going for months. Now, we know we've pivoted and we're talking about COVID, but I I think that you're right, that there, there is good research that's out there. It's just, you know it's the facilitation of how is it getting to the masses? What agenda is being pushed? Um, And it's not. So the good research is very difficult to, Mm -hmm. people are not trained. Mm -hmm. They're not trained in having been in a research facility. They're not trained in reading research. And what gets out there is so incredibly skewed that it Mm -hmm. does people a massive disservice. And it's, it's whatever is a soundbite, you know, whatever is a right. tangential, like, oh, that's a good soundbite. So we're going to jump on that. And then, you know, you have, uh, you know, thousands of people who then follow that. So let's talk a little bit about what muscle is. And, you know, you mentioned that it's not just about locomotion. And I think that's where most people, right. when they're thinking about muscle, they're thinking about, I want to get in the gym so I can either make my muscles bigger, make my body look leaner. So they think about muscle in that regard. How much weight do I, can I lift? But Let's talk about muscle as being its own organ. Yeah, it's probably my favorite topic. (laughs) Muscle 
I practice something called muscle centric medicine. And I coined this term based on my 17 years of experience of education. And what it is, is the foundation is muscle is the largest organ in the body. And it truly is the organ of longevity. Just as there is a cardiologist for the heart and an endocrinologist for the thyroid, muscle is our largest organ. And when you contract it, it secretes things called myokines, which go throughout the body and have different effects. For example, there's BDNF for the brain. There's myokines that affect bone. There's myokines that affect systemic inflammation. And truly, just as an endocrine organ that secretes myokines, it is the biggest um, protector of your physical well-being. Not only is it an organ, an endocrine organ, so that's one aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Another aspect is, is that it's your metabolic currency. It is, what, is I, what do I mean by metabolic currency? It is the largest site for glucose disposal, mm-hmm. which is carbohydrates, fatty acid oxidation, cholesterol is a big deal. And as we age, our cholesterol tends to go up mm-hmm. rather than going on a statin, having healthy muscle tissue can really be protective. It's also really responsible for your resting metabolic rate. It plays a huge part. You know, we were talking about your kids. It plays a huge part in the amount of calories and the amount of energy utilized at rest. Yeah. Muscle is number one, an endocrine organ, and number two, your metabolic currency. And when we think about the diseases of aging, like Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, these are diseases of metabolic dysregulation. Mm-hmm. Truly, it, those are not, those are end, those are the long-term effects of having dysfunctional muscle. And that is a very new concept for people. Why is that? Because metabolism is dominated by your muscle. So we don't become fat, right? So you, it's not that getting fat is the first thing or getting overweight or putting on body fat is the first thing. The first part of that process is having dysfunctional muscle. So not being able to utilize what you're eating. And then once that happens, it spills over into your blood. It's really about being over fat. It's not about, sorry, it's not about being over fat. It's about being under muscled. I think this is, even for healthcare providers that are listening, when I was sitting on the panel with you in Portland, this is the very first time I had heard some of this information, even as a, you know, traditional Western medicine, functionally trained nurse practitioner, the very first time I heard some of these things. And I remember I walked away saying, I have to bring you on the podcast because I know there are thousands of people who have not heard this information and yet it makes complete sense right. uh, without question. And so, you know, I think that when you, when you're thinking that broadly about how the loss of muscle, which is a big fancy world called sarcopenia, you know, that the muscle mass, the strength, the physical conditioning that you lose that then creates this tipping point that makes you much more susceptible to these metabolic disorders it really changes your whole perspective. You know, Absolutely. The cardio queens, as I call them, the people, you know, even my own patients who want to get on the treadmill and they just want to bang out five or 10 miles, you know, if it's raining, it's raining here in Washington, DC. And yet the most important thing they can be doing is building muscle, maintaining their muscle throughout. Absolutely. Their you know, and what happens is that when people have excess adiposity, mm-hmm. they have excess weight, it actually impairs the muscle tissue. And there is inf- there's fat that becomes infiltrated in the tissue, and it doesn't work as efficiently. Really, the excess body fat is one indication of the quality of the tissue. It's fascinating. Yeah. And where do you see this? Does this process start for people in their 20s and 30s, or is it really a bigger issue as people get chronologically older? That's a great question. It depends on how we break out the phenotype of the person. If you're thinking young and healthy and fit, like your kids, then this is going to be something that would be much later on in life. It is, there is an inevitable change in muscle that happens, but 
when you're young, you're driven by hormones. Really, you're, you know, you've got a lot of testosterone and the insulin is actually helping you grow taller. You're not growing wider, which is what happens as we age. Then in midlife, and let's say in even if your 20s and 30s and you're overweight, now you're looking at defects in muscle tissue. The concept of sarcopenia, which is a decrease in muscle loss and function, typically considered a disease of aging, I am telling you is no longer going to be considered a disease of aging. It can easily begin to happen in midlife. Scary. Preventable yes. by two things. Number one, high quality protein, which mm -hmm. is a non-negotiable. And number two, resistance exercise. Mm -hmm. It is one of the most pliable tissues in our body. I don't know about you, but I like to enjoy a nice wine glass after a long day. But the problem is that so many of the wines have harmful chemicals like pesticides or they have way too much sugar, which would damage your health in the long run. After doing some researching, I discovered Dry Farm Wine, the only health-focused natural wine club in the world. Their wine is all natural and additive free lab tested for purity, sugar-free, and low alcohol. So you can enjoy the taste of good wines without the massive chemical or sugar intake. By joining the Dry Farm Wine Club, you can choose how often you'd like to receive the wines. You can choose monthly or every other month and how many you'd like to receive. And as a special gift, if you sign up with our link, you can get a bonus bottle of pure natural wine with your first order for just one extra penny. Visit the link in the description to claim your bonus bottle of natural wine and join the Dry Farm Wine Club. So when you talk about high quality protein, let's talk about that. Um, you know, obviously we're talking about pasture raised, organic, or is it important to you personally? Is it more important that someone is consuming animal protein or is it the quality of the animal protein that is even, is that another layer? I always say it's good, better, best in many times. <laughs> yeah. Like do what you, you can afford to do, but. Yes. So I, I believe that there shouldn't be a cost should not be a barrier to entry. If you are very specific in whether it's organic or grass fed, would that be, that's what I prefer, but that is cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm what would be most valuable is just making sure that they're having high quality protein. And I truly believe that animal protein is the highest quality. And it's really not my belief. I mean, it's based on an amino acid profile. Mm -hmm. And as it relates to that, it doesn't necessarily just have to be red meat. You're talking about eggs. You're talking about fish, um, whey protein. These are all high quality forms of protein that is really based on amino acid and an amino acid profile. Can you be vegan and vegetarian and still get high quality protein? Well, you can still get protein, but the quality is going to be different. And when that happens, you're going to need to add and augment with branch chain amino acids. And then of course, bioavailable iron, zinc, B12, the micronutrients are also going to be really important. Now, are you finding that people are becoming more receptive? I, mean, I know that there's all these names of different nutritional paradigms. You know, there's carnivore, there's vegan, there's low carb, there's keto, et cetera. Um, do you find that you kind of gravitate towards one over the other? You know, personally, I mean, I know we are both meat eaters. Um, so I know that you're, you're not going to, um, you know, align with some of the other more plant-based diets, but just out of curiosity, do you find that? I am much, I would consider myself optimal protein, mm -hmm. which I don't think is a is a diet paradigm yet, but it will be. It's really protein forward. And okay. that's my message. Do we need carbohydrates? Carbohydrates, the body can generate all the carbohydrates it needs. There is obligatory carbohydrate use, which is what the body requires. That being said, for every 100 grams of protein that you eat, your body generates 60 grams of glucose. I believe that individuals who are training quite intensely could, if they wanted to, add carbohydrates in their diet, but I am not in the school of thought believing that carbohydrates are necessary. It is truly what you can stick with mm -hmm. and if your metabolism can manage it. 
Yeah, you know, I, I find that that the carbohydrate piece, you know, on social media is a sticky point for so many people because there are yes. people that will say, if I don't get X number of carbs in my diet, I'm, you know, they get the keto flu. They they feel achy. They're, you know, they've got these cravings. They're exhausted. They've got a headache. And I believe those they're really experiencing what they're stating they're experiencing. But if you if you think about what you just said, that for every hundred gram of protein that you consume your body, their gluconeogenesis will actually create carbohydrates. It, it will spin some of those ideas on their heads. Do you think it's a comfort that people have found carbohydrates to be something that's comforting and therefore that's where some of that stems from? It is so emotional for people. Food and eating is just incredibly emotional, which is, I find very strange. It's almost up there with religion and politics, mm -hmm. truly. And it's what something we do every day and it's what nourishes us. Do I believe that individual, you know, why do I think that it is emotional for people? I think there is a, a big food addiction and people utilize food for comfort and they cannot tell the difference between hedonic eating and eating for hunger. Hedonic eating being that drive other than uh, food deficit, whether it's emotional or stress or pleasure. And they, you know, individuals hedonically eat versus eating because they're hungry. Mm -hmm. And that's truly what I believe ends up happening as it relates to carbohydrates. No, and I, I think I 100% agree with you. You know, food is fuel or food is comfort. And that differentiator for many people is the slippery slope. You know, for a lot of people that, were conditioned, they came home from school and their mom gave them a cookie because they had a good day or maybe they had a stressful day or, right. um, you know, people dive into a bowl of pasta because they're stressed and, you know, they're trying in some way to boost their serotonin levels just temporarily and right. it takes everything off right then and then they're back to, you know, they spike their insulin and so it just kind of creates this very slippery slope. Absolutely. And as a macronutrient, carbohydrates are not that important. There is some question whether it's fiber, but it's really the most important macronutrient is protein. Mm -hmm. And when it relates to muscle, as it relates to muscle protein synthesis, people have to understand that there's a minimum amount of protein that they need per feeding to stimulate that tissue. And that's a minimum of 30 grams of protein, which is much higher than people realize. It's actually between 30 and 50 to really be optimized. And that's important to understand because it is based on the, that, again, that amino acid profile of that high quality protein, that once you start moving into that threshold number, you begin to trigger a cascade through mTOR, which gets a really bad rap, but shouldn't because mm -hmm. it's necessary for high quality muscle in which I told you that the diseases of aging are a result of having impaired muscle tissue first. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to understand. Then you can build in carbohydrates, however an individual would like. I definitely wouldn't recommend going over 40 grams of carbohydrates per meal because then you begin to push your insulin. Anything less than 40 grams pretty much can manage, you know, between 30 and 40 grams. There is individuality. Anything over, than, over that, you're then moving into a increased insulin response and subsequent hypoglycemia. Now, you, you mentioned something really important. How many of us are not getting enough protein? Because 30 to 50 grams is, is quite a bit, probably more than what most people are consuming. And I know Per meal, I, per meal, not even per day. Yeah, per sorry. meal, yeah. Sorry. Um, but most people are probably not getting that in a meal. And so right. I know from the time that I met you, since then I've made a conscientious effort every single time I sit down. And it you are definitely, when you... Protein is so satiating that when you have six eggs or you have a good portion of beef or pork or whatever, chicken, whatever yeah. it is that you're having, you are very satiated. There is not a lot of room to have 40 grams, right. 40 grams of carbohydrates. I agree. Really. Um, and if you're, you're setting up your macros that way, you will, you will be very satiated. There'll be no more room for more food. You will be completely full. And you protect your metabolism by protecting your muscle, it is very difficult to overeat protein. Mm -hmm. There are studies overeating protein and those individuals don't actually put on weight. That protein as a macronutrient is highly thermogenic mm -hmm. and very difficult to store as fat. 
there are many reasons why we should be protein focused. Now, do you, do you practice fasting or are you, are you, okay. I, I do. Fasting is really interesting. I, I think that there's a lot of benefit as it relates to fasting. And interestingly, there's a lot of good data out there. Mm-hmm. For fasting, one of the most beneficial aspects that I have seen in clinical practice is that it really takes the obsession of food away for mm-hmm. people. You are able to restrict calories. Mm-hmm. And allow for bowel rest, so you're not constantly eating, not thinking about it. And I have seen some amazing results from people simply implementing fasting, you know, because there's a capacity that allows it to retrain your circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. And the circadian rhythm, while you do have this suprachiasmatic nucleus, there are clock genes within the body that are regulated by food. That is the second biggest stimulus. And that in and of itself is fascinating and something that can easily be exploited for health. Absolutely. And I do find, I even have patients that don't want to change what they're eating, but just by restricting the amount of time with which they eat, they'll lose weight. And, you know, I always say everyone comes to fasting because they're curious about losing weight, but they'll stay for all the other benefits. A lot of the cognitive ones for sure. Yes. You know who I don't recommend for fasting? I don't recommend if you're trying to get pregnant or if you're older, if you are over. And it's interesting. My dad is over the age of 65 and he fasts. I don't think that it's an ideal strategy for aging tissue, because again, when we're moving into that sarcopenic phase of life, the most important thing that you can protect is muscle, Mm -hmm. right? So we know that, you know, for example, cachexia, which is, uh, significant weight loss. It's 5% within 12 months, but really we've all seen someone who's cachexic and that is really significant muscle wasting, which typically happens quickly. It's what you see with HIV and cancer. One third of cancer patients actually die from the wasting rather than the cancer itself. Wow. And, you know, I mean, that's just a, an example of how important that tissue is. It's because they cannot main, maintain their amino acid reservoir. They cannot maintain their ability to heal, their ability to maintain really a lot of these metabolic functions. I mean, it, it's interesting because last year I had a septic appendix and without diving down a rabbit hole, I was in the hospital for 13 days. I almost died and I lost 15 pounds. And when you're not a big person, I remember when I came home, I looked at my legs and I've, I'm a pretty lean person mm-hmm. and I'm saying it's like my arms and my legs, you couldn't distinguish from the two of them. And they actually sent me home because they didn't want to do surgery until I got stronger. And wow. much to the point that when you lose a tremendous amount of weight in a very short period of time, your body really does struggle to, um, to be able to kind of maintain and optimize. So I can imagine if someone were going through chemotherapy, yeah perhaps, you know, multiple surgeries that that would not put them in an optimal uh, environment to be able to thrive. But let's pivot a little bit. I'd love for you to t- talk about the RDA protein guidelines, which, you know, are, are not nearly where they should be. Yeah. The RDA is the recommended dietary allowance, and that's at 0.8 grams per kilogram. And that was interesting. That is the minimum to prevent disease. And that is based on nitrogen studies, which are really out of favor now and not believed to be the gold standard. And they came up with those numbers during, you know, the time when we needed soldiers. And it was based on, I think it was 1940. And I don't remember exactly. But anyway, it was based on this extrapolation data. And what they determined was this was the amount of protein needed for a soldier to maintain his health for war, the bare minimum, all they were going to feed. And it is so insufficient for optimization. And now newer studies have come out, for example, the ProteAge study, and this is a study on aging, to de- and they determined, and this was a group of experts, determined that the recommended dietary allowance needs to be about double that, wow. at least just to maintain an older adult health. And if you really think about the history, we've been wrong about carbohydrates. Remember, we had the food guide pyramid. We've been wrong about cholesterol. Everyone was anti-cholesterol. 
So it stands to reason we're likely wrong about protein. I'm just saying if, if history repeats itself, uh, we've been wrong about all of the macronutrients. It stands to reason that there is um, issues with the protein recommendations as is. The majority of individuals, the average, uh, according to the NHANES data set, the average, fee, the average amount of protein a female gets is around 70 grams. Yeah. And uh, we already know that you need at least 30 to 50 grams per meal. And in my professional recommendation, I actually recommend one gram per pound body weight. Wow. How many so, people are getting that in all honesty? <laughs> so, I mean, that in and of itself is a powerful, powerful statement. Right. I mean, this is, if they can make one change for 2020, I guarantee you, if you... Determine how much protein you need. And the reason is we want to know how much protein you need because the goal is to protect your muscle tissue as muscle is the organ of longevity. We determine how much protein you need. You separate, you distribute that throughout the day, whether you're doing fasting and you're getting 30 to 50 grams of protein, you can actually go up uh, per meal. If you're only going to eat twice a day, you could go up to meet your protein requirements. So you determine that, and then you determine the quality of the protein that you're eating. This will change people's lives. Mm -hmm. I have seen it over and over and over again. That's really incredible. But I, I would imagine that most, if not all, listeners are not eating enough protein. I just think about my my mom is a reformed vegan. Uh, she has kind of moved on. Now she's eating animal protein again. And I know when I see her, she's... She's so mindful of her portions, which, you know, I, I have to respect that she's conscientious about that. But I always tell them like the protein piece, you can't go wrong there. That and I would say if you focus on your, your protein and your healthy fats, then, then you're doing pretty well. And then the carbs should be a, I always have a doodle barking. It's an ongoing joke. <laughs> Somewhere there's a, there's a dog barking in my house. Dog then, barking, baby crying. We're good. I know. It's all moms trying to manage all this. So Let's just touch on, I mean, I would love, because I, I did a lot of research before we jumped on, um, just for the average listener, for them to understand what are some of the risks of losing muscle? Like, what are some of the things that put you at greater propensity for losing more muscle mass? And, and I think that, you know, that there's obviously an age factor, um, Sorry. Usually there, there's obviously an age factor. We know north of 40, north of 80, you know, there's based on study research um, that I could see, but what are some of the risks? So what are the things that people can be doing now to lower their propensity for having a uh, significant loss of muscle? There's two really big things. Number one, inactivity. Mm -hmm. Bed rest and inactivity is a massive contributor to muscle loss. So let's say an individual gets sick and they're in bed or on bed rest for even two weeks, mm -hmm. you will start to see substantial muscle loss. The second thing is low-grade chronic inflammation, mm -hmm. higher levels of cortisol. And if I wanted to say that there was a third piece, I would say hormonal imbalance. As women age and we lose estrogen, there's actually estrogen receptors on muscle tissue. It's not all about testosterone. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, testosterone is, of course, the traditional, you know, everyone thinks of it as traditionally anabolic, but there are estrogen receptors on skeletal muscle. And when that goes, it also changes the muscle tissue. So as women transition from perimenopause to menopause, they're at greater risk for this, this occurring as well. They are. Yeah. So, you know, those are the top three things. Number one, bed rest and inactivity. Number two, low levels of chronic inflammation. And number three would be arguably hormonal changes. And, you know, when I say hormone, hormones, also thyroid. Mm -hmm. Hypothyroid definitely affects muscle tissue. It affects ten tendon turnover. It affects the ability to utilize glucose. So protect your muscle at all costs, <laughs> truly. And you can see where this is the shift. Mm -hmm. While dietary protein is so important, Really, it's, it's a twofold conversation. Dietary protein is absolutely essential in maintaining the health of this tissue. And that's one 
part of the story. And the second part of the story is muscle tissue is so much more than looking good in a bikini. Mm-hmm. It truly is the most un underappreciated component to vitality. So when we're talking about ways to protect our muscles, what I hear are things like you need to move your body, but obviously strength training, if you're able to do that, that would be beneficial. It's a non-negotiable, but it's a non-negotiable. Right now, while we're in quarantine, we have a whole gym set up. I mean, I granted I live with a Navy SEAL. And what I let me just say, I don't re- recommend being quarantined with a Navy SEAL and an infant. But <laughs> we, you know, we got a gym set up. It didn't matter. We allocated the space. We allocated the funds to do whatever it was going to take to maintain that physical aspect of life. Mm-hmm. You know, what kind of equipment? I can see some of it in the background. <laughs> yeah, no, and have. <laughs> We, we have an Airdyne bike. We have a skier. We have something called a power block, which goes from 20 to 50 pounds. And it's just one block, right? So that's very efficient. We have a Bulgarian bag, which is 40 pounds. We have numerous bands. We have three kettlebells, a 55 pound or 50 something pound kettlebell, and then two 23 pound kettlebells. And that's what we're using. And I think the one thing that I found not being able to go to the gym for the past month, I have TRX bands. I have have some of the things that you have, but a lot of body weight exercises that people sometimes don't realize can be really challenging to do. Um, I'm convinced that we have to have, you know, a 200 pound uh, apparatus in order to get a good workout. But, you know, the lengths that you will go to when you are quarantined to be able to stay as fit and healthy as possible. I think right. that's really key. So and it's hard. It's totally hard. I mean, my husband is very motivated to get up and work out. He gets up every morning at five o'clock and trains and wakes me up. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's hard, you know, it's hard with uh, a lot of things kind of going against the normal routine. Truly. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So strength training is obviously one, you know, taking care of putting your meals together properly. And and I would imagine, you know, during social distancing, you probably have a well-stocked refrigerator and freezer. We do. We do. For sure. We, we have a lot of frozen beef. Um, One of the companies who I love and I have no financial interest or investment or connection with is called Certified Piedmontese. Okay. And they're amazing. And if your listeners want, I have a, a code that they gave me and it's for 25% off. And the code is G lion. And again, I have no financial connection with that. I just really wanted to be able to offer it to my patients. And then we use a company called daily dose and they are organic and very well portioned out. And that way we're able to eat healthy <laughs> without, you know, we have an infant at home and my husband is in full-time medical school. So Kind of a busy house. Finding a way rather than finding an, an excuse, mm-hmm. we, we always find a way. That's great. You know, we're I'm in I'm in the suburbs, so it's a little bit different than being in a city, but one of my dogs who has probably been five pounds overweight chronically now is no longer five pounds overweight because every day, you know, I work out in the morning and then either myself or and or my kids, we take the dogs for like a four mile loop. And talk about that dog has lost the five pounds and probably more because he's exercising more than he normally does. Amazing. Yes. Well, I always love for our guests to leave our listeners with two top tips of how they can help support health and wellness. And I know we've focused a lot on muscle, but I, I think that everything that you've talked about in this podcast will really be um, incredibly beneficial. But if you have two additional tips you'd like to share. Number one, make sure that your plate is anchored in protein. That is your non-negotiable macronutrient. If you do that right, you will regain freedom from overfeeding, overeating, binge eating, metabolic abnormalities as it relates to being overweight. So number one, make sure that you get enough protein and really determine what that is. You have to track because you cannot change what you don't track, period, right? And number two is really getting with someone and getting a good resistance exercise program and not, and not waiting. If you wait till when you feel like you're ready, 
you will never be ready. Mm -hmm. It's really about jumping off first and then feeling ready, or you might never feel ready, but truly just doing it. Because if you can do those things, anchor your plate in protein, get someone to train, do resistance training. If you don't already do that, you really can change the trajectory of your aging and that who doesn't want that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I know that you've had quite a bit on your plate the last few weeks, but (laughs) we're carving out time to connect with our listeners today. Yeah, I'm so happy. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And definitely if you can let our listeners know how to find you uh, when they listen to the podcast. Yes. I'm very active on Instagram at Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, and they can find me on my website, drgabriellelyon.com. I have a bi-weekly newsletter where I put really interesting research, things that I'm reading, books, things that I believe will bring value to people. And I have a course coming out soon. Oh, and by the way, they can also find me on Facebook and Twitter under the same name. Awesome. Well, I will definitely be signing up. I look forward to uh, getting your emails. Yes. And I have a free protocol, actually, that if they go and they download that on my website, it's the line protocol. It's the first first edition. The second one is actually going to be coming out shortly. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Everyday Wellness. If you loved this episode, please leave us a rating and review. Subscribe and remember, tell a friend. And if you want to connect with us online, visit the link in the show notes.